Welcome to Hard Questions, where we gather pastors together to take on your tough questions and answer them right from the Bible. I'm Tom Hollis, the moderator, and today our panelists include... Dr. William R. Glaze, Bethany Baptist Church in Pittsburgh. Pastor Mark Motor, Berean Church in the South Hills of Pittsburgh. Pete Giacalone, South Hills Assembly Guy Church, Bethel Park, Pennsylvania. J. Anthony Gilbert, pastor of Another Level in Mount Washington. Well, pastors, thank you for being with us. Today's a little bit different. It's going to be fun. It's going to be like, these are a few of our favorite things, you know, so we're going to tell you just about some things that have influenced us, some characters in the Bible that have influenced us, and uh, just share a little bit about that. So uh, we're going to start right off with what is your favorite book in the Bible and why? Dr. Glaze. Well, I'm sure like the rest of the brothers, it's very hard to say one is my favorite, but I, I, I must say my favorite is the book of Daniel. Uh, I've taught through Daniel probably three or four times. And the reason why Daniel was one of my favorites is because of uh, Daniel chapter two, where Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He, he dreams of this statue with a head of gold and uh, chest and uh, stomach of silver and uh, you know thighs of uh, bronze and feet and iron of clay. And Nebuchadnezzar, he, he tells Daniel, he, he says to his wise men, he says, I not only want you to t interpret the dream, I want you to tell me what the dream is, mm -hmm. right? Nobody could do it. So he's getting ready to kill all of them, man. And, uh, and Daniel comes and interprets them. And the thing that just blows me away, and a lot of people think that Daniel is actually historical, you know, writing from a historical pr perspective because he's so accurate in what he portrays. But the dream actually portrays the future kingdoms, which would be uh, Babylon, Medio Persia, Greece, and Rome. And it, and, it, and, it, and it fell out exactly that way. Right. And so as I look at that, it just blows my mind to see the precision in which God laid out the future. So Daniel was uh, one of my favorite even books and that's point, the reason. Even to the point of the Roman Empire splitting in two, exactly. the two legs, right. you know, the yeah. Roman Empire East and West. Cool right. stuff, yeah. Pete. Uh, mine would have to be, I was gonna trump in on that, uh, the book of Philemon. And, and the reason why I love Philemon, I, I know it's only one chapter long, but the, but the reason why I love Philemon is because uh, it, you have a runaway slave, what the world would call, and I want to emphasize this, the world would call a loser. And Paul would call very important. You know, Paul, and, and how many people in our lives have we've come in contact with that the world said, this guy, this gal will never make it, but because of pouring your life into them and seeing their lives change, and then even to the point that Onesimus, the runaway slave, winds up, being a leader in the church. I think Polycarp even writes about Onesimus being a bishop in the church. So I love the book of Philemon because it brings hope to the ones that the world said would never make it. Well, that is great, great. This is some good, good stuff so yeah, far. You know, Go ahead. It's, it's hard, you know, it really yeah. is. I mean, uh, one of my favorites though is the book of Genesis. Um, I love because everything is in the Bible in Genesis. I mean, there's not anything. Redemption is in there, the fall of man. Um, I don't think there's not any place in the scriptures you can't take something back to Genesis. Oh, yeah. It's like you get the whole kit and caboodle in those, what is it, 50 chapters. Love the life of Joseph. Um, so outstanding of how he lived and what he had to go through in order to be processed. That's always been a big part of my life and my message mm -hmm. is about the processing, you know, with, with the, but having the promise and going through the, uh, the pit and then Potiphar's house and the prison and eventually to the palace. I mean, just all of that. I mean, but there's so much in there, the life of Abraham that, but also too, I have to throw this in here. Book of Revelation is something I love. Uh, to study yeah, along with Daniel. Yeah, you know, yeah, I, I, it's all in there, you know. So those are the, the those there. I love studying on eschatology. So Daniel and Revelation are really big on that as well. So, I will say the greatest of the four Gospels is Mark. Just to let you know that. <laughs> but I agree. Genesis is, was actually what I had. Uh, I did a study last year on the first eleven chapters, which is the first section of mm. of Genesis. And I look at where we are with sexuality mm -hmm. and morality mm -hmm. as a nation in the earth, and I'm recognizing we've gotten away from the book of Genesis. There mm. are over 50 firsts in Genesis. Yeah. So anything you can imagine goes back to that book. So I wish that was taught in schools. Mm, we need to good. teach yeah, that more in our schools. Point. We can't assume people know that yeah. in our churches. So I'm with you. Genesis is that foundation. And we just cannot assume that young people today know what we learned in Sunday school. Wow. We need to get back to it. 
That's, Amen. That's absolutely true. Well, Amen. I'm going to answer these today. So Acts is mine. I love the book yeah. of Acts because I feel like I'm in it. I'm in the <laughs> book of Acts. It's still going on. We're still taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, empowered by the Holy Spirit. So love the book of Acts. Let's go to the second question. Pete, I'm going to ask you this first. Okay. Who is your favorite character in the Bible and why? Okay. I, I like to read the Bible like a, a novel. When I read it, I, I like to go through it and just, you know, experience with all the wonderful characters from Abraham all the way to, to uh, uh, James and Jude. But my favorite is, uh, believe it or not, Caleb. And the reason That's why great. I like Caleb, uh, we, he was so influential to his nephew that his nephew becomes one of the judges. Uh, and, um, but what I like about Caleb, Caleb and Joshua were the only two that's, that stood against the other ten and said, you know, this land is our land. This belongs to us. And then we have him 40 years later. And who, what does, when, when Joshua offers him the, the, the land of where the giants lived, Caleb said, I've been through this land before. Mm -hmm. I've seen its fruit. I know what it has. I know what it can possess. And Caleb said, I'll go after the giants. When, when the entire nation did not want to go after, they want to, we have this guy yeah. late in life yeah. saying, I've been here through before. It was a missed opportunity. I won't allow this opportunity to be missed a second time. That's I, good. That's I just really see something good. in that guy, Caleb, that I just mm -hmm. really love. Uh, that's that great, Pete. Pastor Blake. Uh, again, I'm going to go to the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel is my favorite uh, biblical character. And one of the reasons why Daniel is, is, is my favorite I think that if you look at other individuals like Joseph, I would say, you know, yeah. he, he, he lived a good life. But, you know, Joseph had, to me, Joseph kind of had a spot on his, on his record, and that is when he bragged in front of his brothers yeah. that they were. Yeah. And so, you know, I kind of look at that and, and cast, again, I, I'm, I'm being overly critical, right? That's okay. Uh, and, and then I think you look at other people, you know, you kind of see a dark mark against their, their, their character in the Bible. Uh, and there may be some that, that have a, a, a pure, pristine character, but to me, Daniel has the most pristine, that you can't find anything against this guy. You know, I mean, he didn't brag about anything. He didn't exalt himself above anybody. Uh, even when they wanted to accuse him when he was thrown into the lines then, they had to trump up an accusation against yeah. him. And the, trump, the accusation they trumped up was praying to his God. So, I, I mean, I, I look at him and I just see him as being one of those, uh, you know, individuals that had a pure, perfect testimony. That, that is really good, really great. Oh, you're gonna love this one. One of my favorites is Joseph. So, uh, <laughs> I kind of mentioned that before, just because I love the process. Uh, and me as a pastor, as a minister in my life, my life has been a lot about processing. And uh, I don't know how many times God has brought me back. But another person I like too is David. Uh, I love, I, I've always been a person that studies on the process of becoming what God's called you to be. And it, two great illustrations of that in the scripture are Joseph and David. I mean, David, his whole thing from the time of getting anointed with his brothers all the way through to even Ziklag and what happened there and the turning point of his ministry. And you know, I like it because both of them, you see their humanity. Yeah. You see their humanity. Daniel, you don't see his humanity. I mean, nothing against your guy, but since you came against mine, I'm gonna call you a You know what I'm saying? You know, but, uh, but you know, I see his humanity. Like, you know, Daniel, he's perfect. You know, and nothing wrong with that, because I agree with you. I mean, Daniel was an outstanding character, but having that Daniel or David and Joseph, like you see their struggles and you can relate to who they are, but also how God was faithful to them and brought yeah, them through and brought absolutely. them out. Absolutely. Yeah, Mark. I'm with Doc. I'm going with Daniel. And uh, the reason for that is simply he walked with God in an unbelieving yeah. society apart from the rest of his family for about 70 years. He was about 90 mm -hmm. in the lion's den. Mm -hmm. My life message is living long and finishing strong. And to me, he's the epitome of that 70 years walking with God. Oh, that is good. You know what? I'm going to side with Jay. <laughs> Joseph is mine. <laughs> I, really, I really do like Joseph. And I, I, I always thought, well, you know, Joseph and Daniel, they're both kind of those almost perfect characters. Daniel yeah. certainly, but Joseph yeah. is like, you know, he does have that thing with his brothers. <laughs> so uh, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're up against a break here. So we, uh, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back in just 60 seconds.
Welcome back to Hard Questions. You know, we're kind of rebuking ourselves a little bit here because we nobody said Jesus as our favorite <laughs> character in the Bible. Oh my gosh. But uh, no, we, uh, we recognize he is the number one Amen. character Amen. in the Bible for sure. Absolutely. Yes. Well, let me ask you this. What character in the Bible is most like you and why? Mark. I would like to say Samson. We are both strong and handsome with long, beautiful hair. <laughs> but I will actually go with Apollos in the Bible. Okay. The scripture says that yeah. he was elegant and competent or mighty in the scriptures. And my goal is to be a teaching pastor. And that's not always popular. People like someone a little bit more flashy. But to me, the scripture says about Apollos that he greatly helped those yeah who through grace had believed. Amen. And I'm a strong believer in the teaching ministry. And so to me, Apollos is a hero of mine. I want to be known as someone who's helping people to grow strong in the Bible. And uh, so if I can't do Samson, I'll do Apollos. <laughs> That's great. How about you, Pastor Jay? Jesus. We oh, know because. Uh, <laughs> now we'll claim yeah, it, right? See that. <laughs> no, not even slightly. Oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Save your emails and phone calls. No, no, no. Uh, I, probably the, the most, you know, it's, that's a tough one there. I mean, there's so many different people that you can pull from in the scripture. But I would like to say David. Yeah. You know, one of the things about me is that um, a lot of people look at me, and I'm going to be real transparent and vulnerable with this, is like, you know, I preach a real strong word. You know, I'm very much a... No nonsense. I mean, that's the word that God's given me is to be that guy, but they don't know my heart. Mm -hmm. um, I've always had a heart uh, for people. Um, always had a, you know, the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. Yeah. And I don't want to make it seem like I'm perfect because not at all. Neither was David. Uh, but just the, my heart for the Lord, my heart for the things of God, um, the heart to, people say, why do you preach the way I do? Because I'm passionate about him. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just stand for that because I think he's worth so much. And I feel like God is many times treated as like a second class citizen. Like, you know, when David danced out of his clothes, you know, and said, I'll be even more undignified. You know, he didn't care about all the pomp and fashion and all those things. He was in love with his God. And that's me. And that's why I'm so zealous the way that I am. Not because I'm trying to be hard or just he's worth it. And uh, worth I just love him so much. And yeah. so that's uh, why I would probably say he's most, I would find myself most in him because of his heart. That's, that's really good. You're a lot like Jesus too, by the way. <laughs> <Just> a little bit. <laughs> well, I guess uh, uh, I, I see myself sometimes and, and some of the, uh, I'm not going to be as serious as Jay. I wish I could be. I see myself a lot like Peter. Uh, you know, that guy one day, he's, thou art Christ, the son of the living God. And then a couple moments later, get thee behind me. <laughs> yeah, foot in mouth. Yeah, foot in mouth. <laughs> I have it right here. Right here, look at it. Foot in mouth, always. So uh, I, 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 throughout, you know, again, I'm 68 years old. So throughout my life, I, I, I see that. Uh, but what comes along with that, I also see the wonderful grace of God that, that sees us through when we have that foot and mouth. Boy, that's, Amen. that's really good. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's like good. Mark, you know, I, I love to teach. I love, love, love to teach the word of God. So to me, Ezra, and, oh, uh, and, yeah. and the I thing that it says verse. about Ezra, yeah. Ezra 7, 10, yeah. he prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, uh, to study the law of and the to, Lord. Uh, I mean, to do the law of the Lord and to teach, teach. the law of the Lord, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I look at that and, and, and that, I want that to be my testimony. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to study God's word. Mm -hmm. I want to do God's word. And then I want to be able to teach the yeah. word of God. So yeah. uh, that, that verse spoke to me years ago. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so Ezra would be the one that, that I... That, boy, yeah. that's really good too. You know, guys, I'm, I'm tempted to say what character in the Bible is most like me and why? Eutychus, okay? Because uh, Eutychus, <laughs> he's the one who fell asleep during a sermon, okay? Just saying something here, brothers, okay? Uh, but uh, I actually <laughs> he, go with... He wasn't in our church. I, I, actually, <laughs> I actually go with Barnabas. I really oh, identify son with Barnabas, uh, son of consolation, the encourager, yeah. the one that, uh, that brought... Uh, you know, when everyone else wouldn't, didn't want to have anything to do with Paul, he was the yeah, one that extended yeah. him the right hand of fellowship. So I, I kind of identify with I him. See that. Well, let's go on to what sermon or Bible passage has influenced you the, the most? Pastor Jay. 
Uh, you know, I would say uh, Matthew 6. Okay. It kind of goes back to the heart for God, you know. I feel like, you know, for me, making God number one in priority is so vital. You know, it's not like, you know, that whole passage to me is like, he said, after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Mm -hmm. He said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added. And, you know, that whole uh, discourse through Matthew 6, he goes through it all, and then he goes through, what are we going to wear? What are we going to eat? What, which is where a lot of the church's mind is at. What about me? And what about this? And what about that? And he's like, listen, after all these things do the Gentiles, just keep me number one. Make me top priority in your home, in your marriage, with your children, in your ministry, and everything else will be added. You know, and it goes back to that scripture with Mary and Martha. I love that part there, and I believe it is in Mark, when he talks about how Martha uh, was running around, she's all troubled and anxious, and she said, Martha, you are troubled about many things, yeah. but Mary has chosen the one thing that is needful. And if we can get back to that Matthew 6 mentality, and if we live that lifestyle, what can't we have? He made it real simple in Matthew 6, and that's kind of been my life scripture. That's super good. Mark. Uh, to me, uh, Acts 17, 10 and 11 talks about being a Berean. Yeah. And I was 14, 15 years of age. I was at a Christian school, and we were going through a Bible class on the book of Acts. We came to chapter 17, and I saw that the Bereans diligently or daily search the scriptures to make sure that what Amen. Paul was saying was so. And I said, if I ever have a church, I'm going to call it Berean. Wow. And we did. Yeah. And uh, wow. that's my life passion for every Christian, regardless of the name of their church, to be a Berean, searching and living by the scriptures. Great stuff, that's good. great stuff. That's that's good. Good. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in its season. Its leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Well, I'm getting blessed. I'm getting blessed now. You know, when I got saved, many of you know this, uh, my family really wanted nothing to do with me after I gave my life to Christ. And uh, it, was, it was a battle. But the book of Isaiah... The whole book has always been one of the most powerful, encouraging books to me. But the verse, the very first sermon I ever preached, I was 17, maybe even 18. Uh, Isaiah 41.10, Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I can't tell you, 46, 47 years of ministry, that how many times this verse has come back to me, fear not, mm. for I am with you. That's Amen. great. Amen. Amen. That's All great. good stuff. My, my life verse is Acts 20, 24. I was reading in the Living Bible many years ago. I think I was 20 years old. And uh, Paul is speaking and says, but life is worth nothing unless I use it to do the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news of his mighty kindness and love. And that's just been my, my life story from from that point forward. So great stuff. I've been really blessed. Uh, I hope you have a, a, a life verse or you have a, a favorite passage that has meant so much to you. Well, coming up in 60 seconds, we will ask our pastors, what gives you the most hope for the future? Welcome back. Well, the next question, and I'm going to be the first one to answer this one because it's an easy answer for me. Who taught you the most about faith in God? Guys, it was my dad. Yeah, I knew you were going to uh, say that. You knew my dad, I, Pete. I knew and, you were going to say that. Uh, there's no question that I am who I am today uh, because of uh, a lot, obviously because of God's work in my life, but a lot of the foundation was laid by my dad. My dad was a steel worker who led Bible studies in the steel mill and uh, led people to the Lord in the steel mill. And... Uh, and loved the Lord and uh, knew a lot about the Bible for being a steel worker. He learned a lot from, from preachers. He didn't fall asleep in any sermons or anything. You know, he learned, he learned stuff. So, yeah, it was definitely uh, my dad. So I, I'll have you, uh, Pastor Glaze. Yeah, you know, I, as, as I thought about that, you know, I've had people that have touched my, lives, my life over the years, but I really haven't had like a mentor or anybody that was strong. Uh, so I'm going to reflect back to when I was in seminary and one of my professors, Dr. Harold Wilmington, 
uh, and I took several classes with him. But, you know, through his uh, book, Wilmington's Guide Through the Bible, I mean, that just had such a profound impact on my life. Yeah. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm going to say Dr. Harold Wilmington. That's great. Well, you know who I'm going with. I'm going with Robert Owen. Yeah. Um, you know, I, he took every moment, whether we were having a bowl of soup or after church on Sunday. Of course, we had on staff when I was there years ago, we had to be on our knees every morning, Monday through Friday. Uh, and I'm a walker when I pray, but we had to be on our knees with him. But he took every moment always as a teaching moment. He'd walk by the office, hey, fella, you got a moment? You know, you'd be right in the middle of study. For you, pastor, yes. And he uh, just was always teaching and living and speaking faith. You know, uh, Robert. Yes, yeah, no, he was your, your uh, he was the senior pastor at South yeah. Assembly for many years, yes. I'm probably uh, a lot like you, my father, my mother. Um, that I think the biggest things that they taught me were the importance you're in church, you know, back in those days, you're in church a lot more hours than you are now. But, uh, you know, you had Sunday morning, Sunday night, Thursday nights or Wednesday nights, whatever it is that you did. Uh, but we were in church continually, but they taught me about how to make God a priority and how to keep God in your home. Me and my brothers, all of us, our greatest encounters were God were never in church. They were in our parents' living room. Wow. And so my brothers, I came home one time from wherever I was at, I think it was a sports event, came home and my brothers were laid out in the living room. Wow. And I said, what happened? The power of God hit them in their living room. I got wow, baptized so in the Holy Ghost in my parents' living room. So they, I woke up almost every morning at 530 in the morning to my dad praying. And I would wow. hear him praying and I would feel the presence of God in our home. Wow. So wow. that's what really Amen. Amen. taught me about the importance of having it in your home not Sunday morning kind of being a transformation chamber, but the house is where it needs to be. So yeah. that's where I learned it. Wow. That's awesome. Great. For me, it'd be my mother. She got radically saved in the mid seventies and began to share with uh, my brother and I, and uh, we would get up in 5.30 in the morning. And before I went to school, uh, I would sit on one side of the table, she on the other, and we would do various Bible studies. And I did that for several years. So I would not Amen. be in ministry or where I am today without her influence in our family. Amen. Well, I love this. I love, I just love hearing all these stories. And, and, uh, and you know, there's been a lot of people in my life, actually, yeah. that have, have helped me along the way, certainly. Well, let's go on to the next one. Uh, I think this is a, is a great question I'm going to ask Pastor Mark to start for us. And uh, what gives you the most hope for the future? We don't have, a, sometimes we don't see a lot of hope on the yeah. news and everything. What gives you the most hope for the future? With all the craziness we're seeing right now, it's one simple statement by Jesus. He said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. So if you remember nothing else, remember this, when we read the back of the book, we win. Thank God we're on Amen. the winning side. Amen. Let's just go right across here. I, go ahead. I think that I look at David and he said when he came up against um, Goliath, he said the hand of the bear and the lion couldn't defeat me. So who is this uncircumcised Philistine? So for me, it's the testimonies of looking back that propels me to go forward. And if the devil couldn't do anything about my yesterday and he couldn't stop me from getting here today, he certainly can't stop me from my tomorrow. So it's my testimony of everything I've been through to get me to this point that gives me confidence that I know God's got tomorrow. That's Amen. Good. Amen. Well, if I can put everything together, and, and I'm not trying to steal any thunder, the Bible says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never Amen. pass away. Mm -hmm. So without, without this weapon, uh, this is what gives me the most encouragement, mm -hmm. is the, the weapon of the Word of God. And I think that's the reason why we're told to hide it in our heart. Amen. That's you know, I would say heaven gives me the most hope. And, uh, you know, there was a little girl and her mom, they were walking out one night and the stars were in the sky. And the little girl looked up and said to her mom, Mom, if heaven is this beautiful from the wrong side, what must it be on the, <laughs> on the right side? And, uh, and so I look at, you know, that and uh, realize that I'm just a pilgrim. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that motivates me to stay on this journey Amen. because I know that, you know, I'm going to a, a place that have foundations whose builder and maker is Come God. On. So, yeah. Yeah. What gives me hope for the future? The character of God gives me hope for the yeah, future. Amen. The fact that I know that he is righteous altogether, that in him is light and there is no darkness at all in, in him. And so to know that, that is a, that good and perfect God 
that has the future. He holds that future. He holds it for me. And if you're his, he holds it for you too. And I hope you are his today. Well, we have a, a closing scripture here that uh, we want to share. Maybe we'll get a little bit of commentary with the time left. And it's from Psalm 1830. And it says this, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. Psalm 1830. Any, any thoughts on that, that scripture? It speaks for itself in my opinion. But. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, God is perfect. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, and I, I look at that and you can't go wrong following him. No. No. And I love it which says, and he makes my way perfect. Yeah. He yeah. makes, you know, his, his way and he makes my way perfect. Yeah. I just think of Ephesians 2 where the Bible says that uh, people who don't know God are without hope. Mm -hmm. And the good news is we're not without God, therefore we're never without hope. Amen. And so thank God that He is that eternal hope and uh, we've got a bright future. Yeah. I said it before and I'll say it again. I hope you know that hope. Yeah. I hope you know yeah. the God who holds the future because He loves you. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's program. I know I enjoyed this one so much. We want to hear from you. Email us your questions at hardquestions at ctvn.org or call into our hotline at 412-349-4326 and leave a question that we'll put on the air. Thank you so much for joining us. God has got a plan and a purpose for you. Don't miss it. He's going to do great things in your life.